Hello, family. Thank you so much for accepting God's invitation to come together today so that we can worship Him in spirit and in truth. I am so excited to be here with you. Um, thank you, Carly, for your video that we just saw and reminding us that God is always with us. In our time of worship last week, we touched on that, about how God is compassionate and how He's always with us. But I love the reminder, too, that God's Christ's body, the church, is also always with us. We're a global church. We're a global community sharing Christ's love wherever we are, in person and online. So I just want to thank you so much to our, our people on YouTube and, and, and on Discord. If you're interested in being part of our Discord community, feel free to go to themeetinghouse.com slash Discord. But it's such an awesome privilege for us to come together. Because don't you find that once you get together in community, now you have that joy, like she said, that energy to serve Him and to live for Him. In those moments when we need it most, God knows how to touch us and speak to us. And He does that through the connection with other Christ followers. So it's so wonderful um, to be able to, com to com connect with you in this way today. So just to remind you also as well, we do have a lot of initiatives globally and locally where we do reach out and we share Christ's love and we want to touch and um, change lives for Christ. So if you're interested in learning any more about those initiatives, feel free to come to our website. If you're interested in contributing to those initiatives, please feel free to give a gift, either one time or regular gift, and you can go to themeetinghouse.com slash give to learn more and also to contribute. So today we are starting a new series. It's called Reconstructing Jesus. I always get this wrong, so I want to look. Reconstructing Jesus, it's week one with Jimmy. He'll be teaching today. But before we do that, as always, we're going to go into a time of musical worship. So as we head into a time of musical worship, let me just pray with you. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us together once again to worship you. And Lord, we pray right now that as we go into a time of musical worship and just to hear more from your scriptures and to learn more about you, that your Holy Spirit will just touch our hearts and our minds. Open our hearts and our minds to receive what it is that you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello. We are so glad that you have joined us today. And we'd love to invite you to please join with us as we lift up the name of the Lord this morning. Prisoner 
this next song that we're going to sing together um, is full of powerful word images of Christ's death and his resurrection. And during the bridge, we're going to sing these words together. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The lamb has overcome. And as we sing those words together, let's just bring to mind the words of Roman 8, Romans 8, 10, and 11. And it says this. Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Though right now we're living in this in-between, sort of in this tension of having his spirit with us, but yet still living in this broken world that's all around us. We know we have this future hope of seeing the fullness of God's kingdom right here. It's going to make all things new. It's the reason that we can sing today. So let's sing these words together.
the Lamb has overcome. And we sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Forever He is born. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Is it adhering to certain moral principles as part of a religion? Is it being part of a community group that agrees upon a certain form of spirituality? Is it a particular branch of politics or policies that govern how we make decisions or make money? Is it just affirming that somewhere, somehow, this figure, this rabbi, this ancient teacher existed? Or could it be something deeper, more relational and communal, more involved and more invested? And if that's true, maybe there are things that we need to reconstruct to understand more about what it means to believe and follow Jesus with our whole hearts, bodies, and minds. I am a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. Jesus is too colossal for the pen of phrasemongers, however artful. No man can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. 
His personality pulsates in every word. Theseus and other heroes of his type lack the authentic vitality of Jesus. Albert Einstein No one else holds or has held the place in the heart of the world which Jesus holds. Other gods have been as devoutly worshipped. No other man has been so devoutly loved. John Knox If Jesus had been an actual historical figure, we have a thorny paradox. Either this Jesus was a remarkable individual who said and did a host of amazing, revolutionary things, but no one outside of his fringe cult noticed for over a century, or he didn't. And yet shortly after his death, tiny communities of worshippers that cannot agree about the most basic facts of his life spring up, scattered across the empire. The truth is inescapable. There simply could never have been a historical Jesus. David Fitzgerald The historical evidence for Jesus himself is extraordinarily good. From time to time, people try to suggest that Jesus of Nazareth never existed. But virtually all historians of whatever background now agree that he did. N.T. Wright Jesus is Santa Claus for adults. Christopher Hitchens Jesus is Lord. Paul I don't think there's any serious historian who doubts the existence of Jesus. We have more evidence for Jesus than we have for almost anybody from his time period. Bart Ehrman But who do you say I am? Jesus Well, brothers and sisters, welcome to the beginning of our series, Reconstructing Jesus, where we're uh, dialing in to exactly those kinds of questions, like what can we know about this figure in history? Uh, what kind of questions do we still have? What do we know about how, like how Jesus treated politics and power? What do we know about how Jesus embodied what he taught, this, this way of peace, this shalom, you know, one with God and one with each other? What do we know about what Jesus actually taught in written record? And what do we know about the historical Jesus? And this is the place where we start. Did Jesus exist? Did Jesus exist? Now, uh, maybe you're here for the first time, um, you know, here in Oakville or at any one of our locations in our regions. This is one of those time periods where we invite more and more questions. So like Quincy mentioned before, um, anything that pings for you or is like a, pe a pebble in your shoe, you're like, yeah, but what about, but what about, what about? Um, email those questions in to ask at themeetinghouse.com, ask at themeetinghouse.com. And at the very end of this series, the last Sunday of this month, that's all we'll be doing. The three of us, myself, Carmen, and Quincy, um, we'll be just navigating through everything that comes in. So please get notes out, get your phones out. Uh, this is a good time to just like make, make notes of those things that like are still bubbling up because we want this to be a dialogue. We'll also mention that this is one of those unique series where we are um, focusing on our spiritually curious brothers and sisters. And so maybe that's here, uh, here, that's you this morning, whether here or watching uh, online, you're like, I am kicking tires around this person named Jesus. I'm kicking tires and, and investigating the potential that there is a God, that there is a God who loves me, that there is a God who loves me and cares about the world, and that there is a God who loves me, cares about the world, and his name is is Jesus. He existed. And so if that's you, we want to give you ample opportunity to actually cross the line of faith, to not just trust in Jesus as this legendary philosophical figure, but as a church community, we believe that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. He is the author, perfecter of our faith. He's the Logos. He's the incarnate word, Emmanuel, God with us, and probably has a lot to do with our daily going about life. That church, uh, you know, uh, affirming Jesus as Lord is not something that just happens on Sunday, and then on Monday we're like, well, legend by virtue of how I live my life. But every day of the week we are the community, the body of Christ. And so we want to give you opportunity to, to investigate, to ask, but then also step in. And we hope that this community, the Meeting House, will be a safe place for you to process, for you to grow, and for you to grow into the reality of being a disciple, a follower of Jesus that comes down from just philosophical belief, but intent. 
how we live our lives, that Jesus did exist and Jesus makes a difference. Now, this question about Jesus existing, it might seem to us like we're like, well, of course, like look what we're doing here. We're 2,000 plus years later, uh, sitting in a building, walking through an ancient text with a short little army pants guy who's, who's talking about like this historical figure. Of course he exists, but fascinating, fascinating. Um, a few hundred years ago, this question came up um, as a rebuke to religion. There is no way thinkers like uh, David Hume, Thomas Paine, and others, enlightened thinkers, so there's no way, there's no way this Jesus of Nazareth could have existed or meant anything that he said because look at your Christians. This Jesus of Nazareth, this, this Jesus in history, is a figment of our imaginations that gets us to our, towards our specific political idealisms, gets us towards like giving money to people who maybe don't need it and don't deserve it. it, it it's, it's, a, it's an idealism that helps us control the masses. You might have heard that like following Jesus is this opiate for the masses. It's a drug that helps us feel better, seem better, look better. But in reality, this is so far from the truth. In fact, in recent years, in the 1970s, this whole notion, maybe you heard it before, um, called Jesus myth- mythicism um, uh, was very popularized. So, you know, the Jesus seminar, Jesus myth, anybody ever heard that before? Yeah, a few of us. So really what the Jesus myth um, uh, asserted is that there's three things that we can know about Jesus. He definitely didn't exist in history. It's just an amalgam of all sorts of different mythology. Number one, that this was the figment of the Jewish messianic imagination. That what we read about Jesus, even in the Gospels, are just a bunch of mythologizing from a bunch of illiterate uh, country bumpkins who are trying to get their way in politics, to have their religion overthrow the powers of the world. Number two, um, that this really is just, uh, you know, um, Jesus was like a created God in and around Rome, similar to the gods, the pantheon in Greece and in Rome, the multitude of gods that called themselves the sons of the divine beings here on earth. So it's really just a figurehead around which people idealized a better um, social and political life. And number three, and certainly like this is uh, recent history, Jesus is nothing more than an amalgam of a bunch of pre-existing deity stories where gods were like born of a virgin, did miracles, had traveling followers, held a divine name, and came back from the dead and invited others to do the same. And so for the beginning of this sermon, that's my intro, uh, we're going to play everybody's favorite sermon game, true or false, true or false. You ready? So if you've heard, I remember a few years ago, I was hanging out with a friend of mine uh, who was investigating faith for sure, and he came across these two documentaries, Loose Change and Zeitgeist, which are about 10 years old, and he was like, look at all this, like, how can you believe what you believe, and I, this has, like, rocked my, the potential of my faith, because this disproves everything that, like, you, Jimmy, have given your life to, and so many billions of others as well, and I was like, oh my goodness, what have we discovered here? And I watched these documentaries and I'm trying to put it nicely, these are lies. <laughs> they are lies. So, true or false? The, the two common claims uh, in both of these documentaries are really focused around Mithras, the ancient uh, god deity Mithras, and Horus. Mithras and Horus. So, Mithras, I uh, hear the claims. Mithras was born of a virgin on December 25th in a cave attended by shepherds. Mithras had 12 disciples with whom he traveled and taught. Ooh. Mithras sacrificed himself to death for the salvation of the world and for world peace. And in the words of prophet Dwight Schrute, false, false. This is not true. Okay, let's break them down uh, bit by bit. Claim number one, Mithras was born of a virgin on December 25th in a cave and attended by shepherds. True or false? False, false. Mithras was born out of a rock. He was born out of the side of a mountain, and the side of a mountain became a cave because he came out of it, out of a rock. He was not born of a virgin unless you consider the rock mountain to have been a virgin. His birth was celebrated on uh, December 25th, as were many other gods in the Roman Empire, and Christians subverted this and placed the birth of Christ on the 25th of December to say, like, our God is legit, your God is is not. Your God was born out of a mountainside, and nobody, there's no written record of him whatsoever. So, Claim one, Mithras, true or false? False, false. Claim two, Mithras had 12 disciples with whom he traveled and taught. In the words of Dwight Schrute, false, false again. There's no evidence whatsoever. 
No evidence whatsoever in the traditions, inscriptions, writing, any archaeological evidence whatsoever in and around Iran and Rome. The idea that Mithras had 12 disciples is really just derived from this mural right here, which is a color version of the mural that symbolizes like 12 zodiac signs, two of which are like the sun and the moon. <laughs> so they're not actually people. So, so Mithras did not have uh, 12 disciples with whom he traveled and taught. False. False. Claim three, Mithras sacrificed himself for the salvation of the world and for world peace. Again, in the words of Dwight, false, false. Nope, but he killed a bull once. That's it. <laughs> That's his heroic deed. He killed a, bu a bull once. So does Mithras sound at all like Jesus, the incarnate word, the author, perfecter of our faith, Emmanuel, God with us? True or false? False. No. No, he does not. Okay, secondly, and even more popular. So, so Mithras was in and around the time of Jesus. Horus predates Jesus by thousands and thousands of years. So as a god in Egypt somewhere uh, between, uh, you know, 5,000, 3,000 BCE, uh, the claims are that Horus was conceived by a virgin mother named Mary, had a stepfather named Seb or Yosef. Ooh. He was born in a cave, his birth was announced by an angel, was indicated by a star, and people followed the star to find him. He died on a cross between two thieves. Isn't this amazing and upsetting our faith? We're closing the church now. Nope, in the words of Dwight, all of these claims are, and all together we say, false. These are false. Okay, claim one, bit by bit, claim one. Horace was conceived by a virgin mother named Mary and had a stepfather named Seb or Yosef. Horace was not conceived of a virgin. In fact, mural and, and um, any textual evidence in and around Egypt uh, suggests that what um, uh, Horace's mother, um, Isis, did is she, how do I say this for church, um, carved for herself a phallic peace over which she hovered and impregnated herself to conceive Horus. Now, strikingly similar to the birth narrative of Jesus, I know. Not at all, not at all. He, she also, again, the, the word Mary never comes into any archaeological evidence that we have, nor does the word Joseph. So, in the words of Dwight, false. Okay, claim number two. Horus was born in a cave, his birth announced by an angel, and indicated by a star, uh, and which people followed to find him, in the words of Dwight again, false. Nope, Horus was born in a swamp. That's it. No star, no angel, there was no star, nothing. Okay, claim number three, Horus died on a cross, ooh, between two thieves, once again, and with this we close, false. There is no evidence whatsoever in any Egyptian narrative inscription or any archaeological evidence whatsoever that Horus died uh, on a cross between two thieves. Horus actually never died. He came back to life uh, and uh, amalgamated himself into the sun god Ra or Re. And, and in Egyptian mythology, we see Horus every morning when the sun rises. He was, he was formed back into the sun. And so in summary, do these have anything to do or do they disprove at all the narrative, the historical record that we have of Jesus, is there any similarity whatsoever? No. No. Brothers and sisters, the, the record of Jesus of Nazareth is so unique, so specific, that actually doesn't bear any of these um, mythological pings, cues, or similarities. So where do we find some clarity then and specificity with the historical Jesus in all of this? Did Jesus exist? Did Jesus exist? Now, Jesus was a rabbi. He was out of the rabbinic tradition uh, in and around, um, you know, uh, anywhere from the year like three to the year six uh, BC, Jesus existed. Uh, he was a rabbi. He went in and around Galilee teaching a way of being teaching a way of understanding God, that God is love and that God loves his creation and that his creation, us brothers and sisters, should love creation and love each other. Now, this might seem like, well, of course, yeah, yeah that seems pretty normal. This was a, a, in direct op opposition to, to the sense of religiosity and the sense of religious mythology at the time, that the gods are somewhere else, the gods are angry, the gods are ruling, and the gods, uh, the gods are enslaving humanity. And so you had to do what you needed to do to appease them. This is a radical shift in the landscape of religiosity, this gentle spirituality that comes in and said, God is creator, God is love, 
God was hovering over the waters by his spirit, his energy, his care. God continues to journey with us. And then God planted himself in human history in the name and form of Jesus above any other name to show us how it's done and to to redeem us, to reconcile our own sin, our own dysfunction back to the salvation, the, the, the salvific work of God. Did Jesus exist? Yes. Yes. Now, how can we trust this? How do we know this? Is it just the Gospels, the four biographies of his life? You saw that first quote from David Fitzgerald. Can we actually trust the written record of these four Greco-Roman biographies, especially since um, these Gospels actually say little to nothing about the beginning of his life? They're focused towards the very end. Okay, so then what can we learn here? Um, In in antiquity, as 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 you study ancient history, any person of character, you always started their story with the end that then moved towards the beginning. So in one sense, if you read just a plain reading of, of the Gospels, you may think, well, there's so little time, you know, between the birth, which is quite an elaborate thing, and then we fast forward like 12 years, there's nothing really that happened. Like, was Jesus an angsty kid? Did he like country or rock and roll? Like, what, what, what were his habits? And then the majority of the Gospels point towards his passion, which means the journey, the narrative, of the story, the progression of him towards his death. Now, for us today, we might think, well, that doesn't make any sense. In antiquity, in in the story-shaping narrative of people of character at the time, it is always how you started. How you died showed how you lived. How you died showed how you lived. It showed your character, showed what you were like put on earth to do. And so it's no surprise that, uh, you know, in in any ancient accounts, um, prominent figures always told the end of the beginning. And this is exactly what we see in the Gospels. Amazing. How you died painted the picture of how you lived. Your last days showed your character. And the Gospel writers compared notes. They compared notes, and they focused on the ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus as the backdrop um, for the impact of Jesus' life and teaching. Number two, timing and teaching. Okay, so this is where a lot of us can get hung up, and um, admittedly, over the years as I was uh, in my studies when I was uh, during my undergrad, like, this is a hang-up. So, have you ever heard, well, we can't trust the Gospels because all of them contradict in one way, shape, or form each other. They all tell sort of different stories, especially as it relates to the resurrection. And then also, they're, they're dated super late. And then also, some of the, the, the authorship of these Gospels um, are, generally speaking, anon- like, we don't actually know who they're attributed to. Have you ever heard that before? wrestled through that before? Absolutely, absolutely. And in a present day or at a cursory reading of the history of the Gospels, this might seem upsetting, but brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you in the ancient record in terms of how we study ancient history, especially 2,000 years ago, the, the Gospel writings are bananas, bananas in terms of their accuracy, in terms of the amount of copies that we have related to any other any other ancient record, the Gospels are telling a story. Now, the majority of the Gospels uh, are written in a certain way, either they're traveling companions of the apostles and that, uh, in that way then attributed to them. It was like, I walked alongside, you know, uh, Peter, John, James, whoever, and I wrote down what happened. And so, you have four different biographies, Greco, uh, Greek, Roman biographies written in a, cer- in a certain way, translated into Greek, which was the common language of the time, and then each coming from a different angle. So have you ever been around like a campfire at camp and you're like telling a story that like everybody there has experienced and one person says, oh yeah, like we went skiing a couple months ago and like we went down that hill and it was crazy and another person was like, you think that was crazy? Remember when we turned right? You think that was crazy? The snow was actually really packed and not soft. And then some of us are like, you think that was crazy? All I came for was the hot chocolate and coffee. Um, This is really the way that that the, the, the authorship, that the formation of the gospels are coming together. They're filtering the story through each of their specific lenses. For example, Matthew, and we covered this in the summer, is talking about Jesus as the new Moses. Jesus as the new Moses, that we are in this new form of exodus of God, redeeming and reconciling everything through this new Moses who is Jesus. Mark is the oldest gospel, so it's like the the OG gospel just going like bit by bit by bit by bit. 
Luke is like the most historical, so uh, Luke's biography, Luke Acts, he writes both of those books as an historian, a doctor, some scholars would say, that's just going like, okay, this is how it happened. This is how I have heard the story, traveling along likely with Peter, and I'm just recording and recording and recording. And then John's gospel is like, after you've had a couple Red Bulls. Like, it's the most philosophical. And so John's gospel in particular is coming at like the Greekified version of the story that Jesus is the logos, the logos, the incarnate word. Now, the gospels were written, most scholars agree, within the the, uh, 30 to 50 years of Jesus' death and resurrection. 30 to 50 years, not 100, which, um, you know, some more skeptical scholars would say 30 to 50 years years written down and circulated. Isn't the Bible amazing? 30 to 50 years written down and circulated. The story of, recorded, um, of Jesus recorded in history, though, is um, it's, it's passed around in this like conversational style, but it's fascinating. People get, who get hung up on like, well, the dating of the Gospels, like that's all we have, and therefore if those like, uh, if there are discrepancies in the text, we just have to throw them all out. The earliest record of Jesus' life and story is not the Gospels. It is not the Gospels. Do you know what it is? Josephus. Josephus is a little bit later. The the earliest written record of the story of Jesus is the Apostle Paul, dated within the first seven to ten years. Dated within the first seven to ten years of Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection. All of you should be like scratching your head and be like, oh my goodness, that is amazing. Holy smokes, it is amazing. Again, can any of us remember where we were five years ago? Can you remember a story that's important to you five years ago? Imagine if you witnessed this human being who claimed divine sonship for himself be killed and then was resurrected and you met him. Would you remember this story, brothers and sisters? Yes, absolutely. And it's fascinating. The first creedal definition, which is like um, poem, recitation, reminder, uh, this thing that you, you memorized was this phrase, Jesus is Lord. All over the Roman Empire, this phrase is is popping up in groups of people who are following the way of Jesus. This was not an isolated fringe cult in just a few hundred years. This fringe cult that were bent on serving and loving and caring for the planet and the people in it took over the Roman world, so much so that a couple Roman emperors were like, maybe we should do it like them. Maybe we should use some of their methodology. Jesus is Lord. Now, there are three incredible, incredible sections of Scripture uh, that Paul writes. Um, one is First Thessalonians 4, uh, another one is Galatians 2, and the third, which I'm going to read a couple times, is First Corinthians 15. So First Thessalonians 4, just one excerpt, verse 14, commonly dated within 10 years, 10 years by Paul. Now, remember, Paul the Apostle, formerly Saul, was, was raised in this Pharisaical tradition, knew his stuff, was like a, a Jewish leader, lawyer, uh, interpreter, historian, all of the things. Uh, and in the book of Acts, we read that Paul is trying to shut down this new movement of the way, that this is false, not true, can't be true, has an experience with the risen Christ and changes his entire life. This historical interaction, connection with Jesus, changes the course, the course of his own story and his own history. In First Thessalonians 4, he writes, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. (laughs) Never in the written record or even in in the mind uh, of a Jewish person did anybody expect the Messiah to, to A, be killed, and B, to rise again. Here is Paul, a former Pharisee, saying, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. That the resurrection of Christ is not just a one and done event. It's for all of us. It's for all of us that Jesus is in the business of resurrecting our spiritual lives and in the end, resurrecting our bodies. Incredible, incredible. Galatians 2, commonly dated within the first 10 years, plausibly earlier. Paul, again, this former persecutor of the church, this religious historian says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. A common term used to refer to Caesar Augustus specifically, Son of God. Instead, it's Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you seeing a theme here? And then 1 Corinthians 15, 3, which most scholars would say this is like the earliest written record of that Jesus is Lord creed. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8, likely recorded within the first seven years, seven years from the, from the death and resurrection of Jesus. Seven years, he says, and so I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Jesus died for our sins, for our dysfunction, just as the scriptures said. He was buried, he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. And here's the proof, the historical record. He was seen by Peter or Cephas. He was seen then by the 12, the disciples. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers. Again, this was in seven years, seven years, 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, so you can check in with them, though some have passed or died or fallen asleep. And then he was seen by James, and who is James? The brother of Jesus. If anybody is going to refute the divinity, the, the record of Jesus, it's going to be this brother who lived with him and be like, no, he was just like too many Red Bulls, that's not who he was. Instead, the resurrected Christ, his own brother, is seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, though, as though I had, Paul, been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Jesus is Lord. So, what did the earliest followers of Jesus affirm? It's false. It's a, an amalgam of a bunch of mythical deity stories. It's false. It's just a, an idealized political agenda by Messianic Jews or Jews at the time trying to get their way. False. It's just a covert operation to push against the ideology, politics, and powers of the gods of Rome. Or true. Jesus is Lord, King, Master, Messiah, the Son of God, the incarnate deity here on planet earth, showing what God looks like and showing what God intends for human life to look like. Brothers and sisters, the earliest disciples, the earliest people of the way affirmed that Jesus is not legend. Jesus is, without a doubt, Lord. The historical record shows this, this, the historical record of the people who centered on Jesus as the author and perfecter of their faith. Jesus is not legend. Jesus is Lord. And I wonder how we feel about that today. Many of us um, live like Jesus is Lord on Sunday right? It's like I'm here for church, I was lifting my hands during worship, I'm giving to the offering, I'm, you know, connecting with people around me in my seats and shaking hands, and then on Monday, Jesus, legend. Can't bring that into my workplace, can't bring that into my conversations. You know, sometimes we arrive here for a Sunday morning gathering or home church or whatever it is, and, you know, we're with our family and we're like, oh, Jesus, Lord, isn't this great? And then on the car ride here, though, Jesus is legend, and our conflicts at home with our spouse or our family, our brother, our sisters, our cousins, aunts, uncles, whatever it is, Jesus is legend. With how we handle our finances, we hear, hear about this compassionate God who's like, sell everything, give to those who are marginalized and broken and need your care. Yes, Jesus, I hear you. Jesus is Lord. What, what are you going to do with that? Oh, well, Jesus, in the area of my money, is legend. And so who do you, who do I, who do we say that Jesus is? How do we affirm or dispute this by our daily walking around lives? Who do we say, believe, trust that Jesus is, Lord or legend? Now, turn very quickly in your Bibles, or actually, um, we're running a little, a little bit out of time. Uh, I want to just take us over to Matthew 16, which is an incredible section of Scripture. So Matthew 16, Jesus is, um, he's, he's asked for a sign from the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time. He's up north uh, in and around Galilee, and he takes his disciples over to Caesarea Philippi. And just before this, the Pharisees are like, you're such an affront to our religion. Like, we know how we're doing these things. We, we follow the ways, follow the law, follow, you know, the commands that we're given. Uh, if you are who you say you are, if you are Lord and Messiah, Emmanuel, then give us a sign. And Jesus is like, nope, that's it. 
And then Jesus takes his disciple to the region of Caesarea, uh, Caesarea Philippi. Now, Caesarea Philippi, um, two things that were happening. There, um, uh, it, it, was, it was a very pagan uh, spot. It was a pagan city that was renamed after uh, Caesar Augustus. Now, um, there were a number of altars, one of which was a pagan altar called the Gates of Hades. So it was a split in the rock, like a, a formation in a cave in and around Caesarea Philippi that was called the Gates of Hades. And this was like representative of, of, of like the pantheon, the multitude of gods. Like this is where evil and good goes in and comes out. And Jesus takes his disciples to the gates of Hades and says, this will not prevail over you. I'm bigger than this. And so he takes them to um, the foot of this rock, to this uh, section, and he says, like, who are people saying that I am? Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Which was a common title that he had for himself, uh, referring to uh, Daniel 7, which we'll get to next week. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the other prophets, and then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Brilliant to the heart, but who do you, what do you think? This is not just about like religious memorization. It's not just about philosophical uh, transcendence. The, the living God is here now making a difference in your life. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven, the God of the universe, has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being, and now I say to you that you are Peter, Cephas, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or the powers of hell, the gates of hell, will not conquer it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the presence of God on earth, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven, and then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone. Okay, that's weird, right? Jesus has this like beautiful, like intentional engagement with all of the the competing gods and asks, what do you think and how will you live it out? And then Jesus sets his own terms. Don't tell anybody yet. Let's live this out. Let's show it. Let's show that by our actions, we, we live as though Jesus is Lord, not just Jesus as legend. This is not a figment of our imagination. Belief in Christ, faith in Jesus, should make a difference in how we orient our lives. Who do you say that I am? I think that's the question for us today, as we begin this series and as we navigate and reconstruct this picture of Jesus that is beautiful, connected, not hungry for power, teaching and instructing our daily lives, embodying what it means to hang out with with sinners and, and sick people and those that are marginalized, teaching us, instructing us like how God loves us and then proving it through history. But none of it matters if we can't answer the question, who do you, who do I, who do we say that Jesus is. I love you, Jesus, but I can't stand your Christians. There's no greater cause of atheism in the world than people who profess Jesus with their mouths but then walk out the door and negate him with their lifestyles. Who do you say that I am? Now, maybe you're investigating faith. Maybe you're here for the first time, and you're like, wow, this, I, I had no idea. I had no idea like how provable the historical Jesus is, but none of it matters unless we're like stepping across the line of faith. And so we'll be playing, just like Quincy said uh, in, our, in our intro time, we want this to be a safe space for you to be able to cross the line of faith, to receive Jesus as Lord and not just exist in the orbit of Jesus as some sort of legend good teacher. And so maybe that's the question for you here this morning as you're hearing this, whether here or in line, you've been investigating faith for long enough and you're, you're sensing the spirit inside you saying, it's time to take a step from legend status to Lord status. From questions and doubts to faith and trust, all communally, all communally within the body of Christ, who will you say that I am? 
For those of you that are investigating faith, we believe that Jesus is the best thing, the best thing that you could orient your life towards, that God is love and that God loves you, died, sacrificed himself for you, cleanses you, reconciles you back to the heart of God and to the community of God, and that you would be part of an unstoppable force of good in the world. Who do you say that I am, legend or Lord? Brothers and sisters, if you are investigating faith, step in. That's the best thing that you could orient your life towards, Jesus as Lord. Or maybe you're like an OG, OG Christian. You've been doing this for a long time. And you're starting to feel maybe that sense of like, yeah, I just kind of do the same thing and the inspiration, the life of God in me just feels quiet, dull, honed down, maybe a little boring. Maybe your life in God has, has, has taken legendary status. Like, yeah, I think about it, but there's nothing that I do. There's, I, I'm, I'm not stepping into the life of Christ. I'm not stepping deeper into the life of faith. And maybe this is that impetus. This is that, that message of the Spirit for you again saying, cross over. Leave the legendary status bef- behind. Step into Jesus as Lord, master, caregiver, leader of your life. Brothers and sisters, as a church, we affirm and we say with like thousands and billions of years, uh, uh, thousands of years and billions of voices, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. But then my prayer is that daily we will, we will answer Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? When you leave this building in just a few minutes, When you go about your daily lives, your work lives, your family life, your financial life, your giving lives, your serving lives, your traffic lives, Jesus is Lord or legend? I'm going to give us just a a minute or two in just silence. And I want you to ask, Jesus, what are you saying to me right now? Are there areas of my life where you have been more legend than Lord? Please bring, bring me back to the center. Or maybe, like I said, you're investigating faith and you're like, Jesus, I, I'm, I'm sensing your presence here. I want to give my life to you. How do I do that? I want to give us just a minute to navigate that and then I'm going to close us uh, in an ancient, uh, ancient prayer. So let's pray together. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We believe in the Spirit who is hovering over the cosmos, bringing order, who lives in us, cares for us, and moves us towards Christ-likeness. We believe in, in, in the incarnate word, the Logos, Emmanuel, God is with us, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We believe in the power of Christ, his life, his love, his death and resurrection, his spirit that lives within us, in the power of God's love in Jesus that is making all things, bringing all things reconciled to God. And so Jesus, wherever we find ourselves today, investigating faith, long time in faith, may we be able to, in full confidence, say that Jesus is Lord. And so, brothers and sisters, may we know the power of Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, his love, his spirit that lives within us. And may we say this morning with confession and confidence that Jesus is Lord. 
may we say with confession and confidence that Jesus is Lord. May we say with confession and confidence, brothers and sisters, that Jesus is Lord. And together we all said, amen, amen, and may it be so. He's alive, he's alive, King Jesus is alive, Jesus is Lord, amen. Thank you, Jimmy. And if you are investigating faith, or if you're feeling alone and you're looking for a community to help you live as if Jesus is Lord, please connect with us at themeetinghouse.com slash, slash home church. We do have home churches that are in person or online. We still have home, home churches that are online so that they're more accessible to you, okay? So before we leave, I'm just going to leave you with some words from the scriptures. Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21 says, Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do his will, working among us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is Lord. Have a great week. Go in peace.